Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. Today is part three of how to make $100,000 or more, ideally more, in fourth quarter. We're not limiting you to just earning $100,000 in fourth quarter. So, you know, adjust accordingly. Well, actually, it's funny you bring that up because I've had so many coaching calls and I've talked to the coaches today, and this is a very common reaction from our coaching clients. That is exactly what they said. They said, well, you know, you based your math on an average sale price of $400,000. What if my average sale price is $750,000? And I said, well, you have two options. You can stick to the math of doing your eight to 10 listings and make more, or you can say, well, maybe for you, it's only going to take seven or eight listings. It's your choice. That's can the freedom you have when you're proactive. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. So considering our average sale price, we had to work our way up to 850 because when we were selling real estate, we started out the average sale price in Columbus, Ohio, of like 200 grand. And eventually we got yeah. it to up to around 850. When you hear someone start out in the business and they're making their average sale price is 850 or a million, don't you secretly have bad thoughts about them? I do. I still do. I'm like, oh, good grief. Because we're mean, jealous. Honestly, it, it is probably easier than you guys think. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, a common conversation is, well, yes, we're seeing more expires, but oh, there were only 40 expires in my MLS today. Well, okay. How many of those do you need to list? I know. Right? Two per month. It is incredible. I was talking with a guy from Ohio, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, he sold real estate in the areas where he used to sell real estate in Columbus, Ohio. And his name was Jared. So Jared, if you're listening, hello. And we were talking, his average sale price was 350, right? Mm-hmm. So he was selling out in Dublin. Yep. And we were talking, and I asked him, well, so why is it that you're not selling real estate that's, you know, in Columbus, you could sell stuff that's three times as much. Why aren't you doing it? And you and I both know the answer. People, generally speaking, only feel comfortable selling real estate. That's the same, you know, give or take price of their own, you know, house, right? Sure. Where they live, their neighbor, their community, they, that's where they feel the most comfortable. So I challenged him. He's 34. I challenged him because you and I increased our average sale price by four or five X when uh, you were 29 and I was 30, right? right? National Association of Realtors did a nice article on us when we did that and all that. Um, But the moral of the story I challenged him with was, why don't you just change markets? So for those of you who are like Julie and I, or you're hearing people talk about these high average sale prices, chances are in your market, there is an area where the average sale price is a lot higher. And Premier Coaching and our coaching, uh, all the systems, all the scripts, all the objection handlers, all the presentations, everything, it works when you're selling double wides in the middle of nowhere, or it works when you're selling ultra luxury properties with average sale prices of over a million dollars. We have, we, just using as an example, Rob Johnson, one of the greatest agents I personally have ever coached, absolute gentleman. He is the number one agent with his brokerage in um, uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, and his average sale price is probably like $12 million. And then we've had coaching clients that have passed through who have average sale prices of maybe 80000 Well, they're using the exact same system, exact same scripts, and they've worked, uh, obviously, in all kinds of different markets. Like Rob was, when I first started coaching him, he was in a market that was super slow, things it was definitely a buyer's market, now it's a seller's market. Everything works the same. That's the nice thing about stepping into Premier Coaching is you're stepping into a mature system that's proven to work in all market conditions and all price ranges. And by the way, the best thing, I would think that most of you will agree this is the best thing for all of you with Premier Coaching is that it is your way forward and it costs you nothing to join Premier Coaching. And you get 30 days of access to Premier Coaching, including a daily semi-private coaching call, including objection handlers and scripts and all the rest of it. So we know you love this podcast. It's the nation's number one listen to daily podcast. Can you imagine how much love you're going to feel for Premier Coaching? It's the podcast amplified by like a thousand X. All you have to do is text the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372, and you can get immediate access to all of Level 1, including your daily semi-private coaching call with one of our certified coaches. So go ahead, do that now. Text the word Premier to 47372. All right, Julie, we are moving on to Part 3, and I'll get started on this, and you can help me out, okay? Sure. And remember, we're talking about ways to make at least $100,000 in the fourth quarter and adjust accordingly. So point number seven, small and medium-sized builders who are building homes on spec. Um, so this means that they're speculating on a home that will sell. They There are many iterations of this, and we teach all this in Premier Coaching, obviously. 
and this is working for a lot of our clients lately, is to identify buildable lots and take them to a small builder or a medium-sized builder. You, uh, you could sell the lot and then list the spec home. Obviously, try to make the sell of the lot uh, predicated on you getting the listing for the spec home. Spec, again, being they're building it in speculation that somebody will buy it. Often bringing the buyer to them as well. And I'll, like um, in uh, Iowa, where we have a lot of great coaching clients mm -hmm. and people that are part of our EXP group, they work a lot with the builders out there, and they actually list the builder's unsold inventory. In some cases, these are homes that people backed out on. Uh, maybe they couldn't afford it because the interest rate went up to 5.5%. And, and when there's the, tons of that going on right now. There's tons. And it's not stuff you're going to be able to find readily available on the MLS. You're not even going to necessarily find it when you walk into the new builder's rep. You have to listen to our past podcast or even better, get the coaching on how to have those great, very proactive conversations with those new build reps. And that becomes one of your best spokes ever. And remember, obviously, depending on price range, most of these new build reps are going to be a very, very powerful source of listing referrals for you. Because again, depending on the price range, they're going to be having buyers that need to sell their home first. So if you befriend that new build rep, 99% of the time, new build reps, an employee of the builder, can't list homes outside of their model home, not an independent agent. They're just selling that new build reps or that new builder's uh, product. You then can get those listing referrals from that new build rep. Um, and most cases, they're not even going to ask for a referral fee. What they're going to want mostly is you to bring your buyers to that new build rep and help them sell inventory because that's how they make money. Point number nine, Julie. Point number eight is flippers. Oh, sure. Sorry. And, and uh, Larissa Burke in Columbia, Missouri is going on an appointment this afternoon or tomorrow about this exact thing. So flippers, sure, they might be able to sell the home on their own, refer to the previous for sale by owner point, but flippers often will list with you so you can bring a buyer to them before they're actually finished with the flip. This helps them because then they can flip more homes in less time, a bird in hand, so to speak. Meanwhile, while you have it listed and they're finishing it, the house generates more and more buyer and seller business for you. It's a win-win for everyone. And she said she's noticed more of those types of properties hitting the market right now. Maybe that's uh, FOMO on the flippers part. Maybe that's because they're buying stuff at a better price now. Here nor there, she's still going on the appointment. Well, most flippers are using hard money. And if you don't know what that is, basically they're borrowing money uh, from somebody with the interest rate probably being somewhat onerous. And those loans are usually for a very short period of time. So in other words, you know, Bob and Mary buy a house to flip. They're, you know, they're entry level or mid level investors. They're going to fix the house up, put it back for sale, and they've based their entire business plan on a very short days in the market and then being able to get a certain return on investment, including the interest that they were willing to pay on that loan. And maybe they even struck a deal with the investor that they're, or for the, you know, their hard money source, that they had no payments in, in uh, for basically 90 days or whatever, right? Typical. But what happens is the day, as the days on the market last and take longer, as the days it takes to rehab the house because of all the things we know about supply chain, you know, whatever, whatever, Putin, whatever you, what else would you right. want to blame it on, you know, just the ready availability of uh, construction workers, all that stuff's under con a huge level of constraint. Well, that means that a lot of these lower level investors who are using hard money are now going to be facing down the barrel of losing all their margin because of the fact that they have to pay these higher interest rates on these loans. But even worse, a lot of these are balloon loans. In other words, if they don't pay the loan back, they don't have a choice to uh, like the, the hard money guy. His deal usually will say, you either pay me back within a certain amount of time or I get the house or I get an interest in the house or something like that. So, Or I'll make my 17% interest on my hard lo money loan to you. Right. Flipping money into a market or flipping a house in a, a market like this, um, it can be a absolute nightmare. So we strongly suggest all of you who are thinking about doing that, be very careful. Here is the insurance policy, uh, not in the literal sense, but you know, in the figurative sense, you can buy against a bad flip is if you can finish the house, get the house uh, fixed up, Reef essentially, you know, if you're doing hard money, then get a mortgage on it from a normal uh, lending source at, uh, say, for 30 years. Use the equity you built in the house to show as your down payment on that investment property. And then if it makes sense as a rental or maybe even a VRBO, that's the path to go. But I would not ever coach anybody to be buying any kind of fast money flips in a market like this unless they absolutely positively knew that they had an exit plan other than selling it in the event that they couldn't or in the event that the math didn't work and they had to hold it as a rental. Yes, but this, this goes to there are flips that have been underway that it had not been finished by the time the market shifted, and those flippers are very motivated. Point number nine. list with you. Okay. Yep. Point number nine is probate. Not many agents prospect probate leads because they don't understand it. Probate is simply the process of selling a home after someone passes away. 
the court appoints an executor of the estate who can then sell the property. If keeping the home in the family is not an option and the executor or executors wish to cash it out, then that's a listing. Sometimes they'll reinvest the proceeds in real estate. Sometimes it's just the listing that you'll sell. But either way, they need someone caring and competent to get the job done. And typically, they're very motivated. And Julie and I purchased properties, one of the investment properties we bought in Southern California. We don't own any more properties in California, but that was essentially exactly what Julie just described. By the way, for those of you who are involved in Premier Coaching, make sure you're leveraging the new probate section. Is that in Premier Coaching? Have you guys it got is, all that? It's not done yet, but it's underway. Okay, so there is a new probate section that is yes. coming to Premier Coaching. Mm -hmm. And we will have a lot of it in the first level that you will, have, you will have immediate access to. So, Julie Harris, when will the probate content be up? I was up? just asking that today of our staff. Okay. So, probably two weeks or less. Okay. There you go. So, probate, again, is a great source of business. I will also say this. Probate prospecting or po probate uh, proactive lead generation, it really doesn't take that much skill. You're not having an emotional conversation with whoever it is that's working, maybe it's the probate attorney or maybe it's whoever's basically in the family that's dealing with it, again, maybe an attorney. So those conversations are very good conversations to have, especially for those of you who are maybe more on the analytical side. Probate works out to be a stellar source of consistent business. You only need a few probate attorneys and then the next thing you know, you've pretty much are a listing machine and everyone's gonna wonder how you did it. And that is coming to you in Premier Coaching and you know what to do. Join Premier Coaching by texting the word Premier to 47372. Text the word Premier to 47372. By the way, remember when, met, when texting, message and data rates may apply. Point number 10, Julie Harris. Point number 10, and another example from Coaching Calls today, Jennifer Turner is working on this. I'll explain that in a second. Your professional center of influence. When was the last time your favorite lender sent you leads? When have you asked? Whom do they know who's getting pre-qualified right now to buy and who has a home to sell? Stagers are also great to know because the sellers will sometimes will call a stager first. Refer business to stagers and ask for leads to an exchange. Now, in Jennifer's case, professional center of influence, she has somebody at the city who is telling her who is turning their utilities off. <laughs> That's a great idea. And she's popping by with some cookies and a thank you card. You know, this is professional center of influence. If you have enough of these things going at once, you've got a pretty good spoke happening. All right. So. Well, but along those lines, one of the things that we suggest all of you consider doing is uh, we're not going to get into the weeds on this, but make sure you're working with multiple lenders because no one lender is good for all different types of buyers. And then have maybe a gentleman or uh, what would be a feminine version of gentleman? Let's just say, what would it be? I don't, gentle lady? Gentle I don't lady, yeah. <laughs> agreement with that said lender, the loan officer, that they are going to send you, you know, for every loan officer, for every lender lead you send to them, they're going to send you a pers prospective real estate client lead. And if they're not sending you prospective real estate client leads, chances are they're not a very good lender, frankly. They don't have any lead generation going on themselves. Right. So maybe upgrade your lender. That would be a good idea. When you guys say, like when you're starting out in real estate and you say, I can't compete against a team, you've got a team. It's you. You're the you know real estate sales professional. You have the title agent. You have whoever your lender or lenders are. You have your home inspector. You have all those types of people. So you do have a team. So make sure you don't put yourself at a disadvantage in your mind to the minds of the consumers by saying you don't because you do. And by the way, yes, you can include Julie and I as your team. Uh, members, and we're, of course, your real estate coaches. Next point, Julie, is point number 11. Point number 11, investors. Join your local investors club. You can find them at meetup.com. There's also a lot of Facebook investor groups uh, in your town. You'll know who's looking for what property and which investors are likely to sell. This will also give you insider information about pocket listings, which can then benefit your buyers. So make sure you are talking with investors and you do know what's going on with that. So another little idea, an, an iteration on what Julie just said, um, and we've had a lot of people do this. There are a lot of lenders or a lot of investors rather that will do wholesale offers to prospective buyers. They'll like classically speaking, they're the people that run the we buy ugly houses type marketing. Now, I, I know a lot of that space and a lot of your markets is starting to be dominated by the bigger eye buyers, at least they were. What happened to that business model? Oops. Mm, refer to previous podcasts. Exactly. But moral of the story is the, there are a lot of investors that will try to market and advertise. Um, and, you know, they just do it a whole direct mail. They'll do billboards. They'll do little, you know, tacky signs everywhere. A lot of them will do door knocking. They're looking for people that want to wholesale their houses. And they, by the way, often will work probate as well. 
What do those investors do with the, you know, nine out of 10 that turn them down, uh, turn the investor down for wholesale offer? What do they do with those leads? I've had, Julie and I have had coaching clients, all of our coaches have had um, agents who make a fortune off working with those investors to get those turned down. So it's simple. You know, the investor uses their system to solicit somebody to possibly buy their house wholesale. You know, wholesale might be in your market 10% off, whatever it's worth less, probably more like 20 or 30. The buyer says no, or rather the seller says no. What happens to that lead? Most of these investors don't do anything with the lead. It just goes in the trash can. Mm-hmm. You call the investor. You say, what do you do with your turndowns? Hopefully that investor has a real estate license. Most of them do. If not, have them get one. And then start paying them referral fees for the leads that they send to you that actually get listed. Yes. Okay. So for example, Lance Kenmore out in Washington, he does this routinely with several of these We Buy Ugly Homes advertisers. So the advantage to that is that those investor guys are paying for that advertising. Lance is not paying for that. He routinely calls them. He uses them for two purposes, as you illustrated. Number one, great source of listings, but also a great source of flips occasionally for him because they might have turned down that person who's highly motivated because there's just not that much room for the, it doesn't meet their investor criteria. You mean, what are they doing with the one out of 10 that decides to wholesale when they buy it and they decide to flip it? You're saying that's another great source of listing leads, yes. which is great. Yes, yeah, exactly. it's a very valid point. But it, so how do you get involved with these guys? Julie mentioned meetup.com. Uh, I think it's dot com. It and, there, and there's all these little investor groups that get together. And I mean, <laughs> They'll meet sometimes at the local restaurant for coffee in the morning, or maybe they're yeah. meeting in a church basement. Sometimes they'll meet at the MLS boards and whatever, and they'll just swap ideas. But where a lot of them are doing uh, these types of uh, conversations is on a uh, Facebook group. So you just got to be digging down in this. And this is a great, this is a killer spoke for you. Point number 12, Point Julie number Harris. 12, and I believe last week we did an entire podcast series about this. And we this did. is door knocking. It's not at the top of the list because it does take more contacts to take a listing, but it is still very effective when you're consistent. Door knocking can help you become more comfortable speaking with people about real estate. And many times you'll be at the right place at the right time and indeed take listings because you're there. Before you go door knocking, choose your neighborhood wisely. Again, we talked about this a lot, very drilled down on other podcasts. Does that neighborhood turn over much? What's the average sale price? What's currently active, pending, and recently sold? What's being built around the neighborhood? Is there near co- new construction nearby? Become the go-to neighborhood specialist and get and use good scripts at the door, provided by Premier Coaching, of course. Start with your own neighborhood since you already know it really well. And again, remember our podcast series about door knocking. We had a lot of specifics on there to make sure that this is a great spoke for you. So I wonder how many are listening right now thinking to themselves, there's no way, and obviously we want you to make at least 100000 in fourth quarter, but the reality of it was what we really want you to do is we want you to list enough homes that actually result in the sales being over 100000 Guys, be very, very clear. If you want to have a long-term sustainable career with ever-increasing levels of success in real estate, you've got to be a listing agent. There's no shortcuts to long-term ever-increasing levels of success. You cannot fake your way to it. You cannot buy your buyer leads the way to it. You cannot influence your way through it to it. You have to become a listing agent. And if you have a choice, what should I be doing with my two or three hours per day that I've devoted to really focusing and drilling down on my real estate business? There's only one answer, guys. And the answer is not to do a TikTok video uh, or a bunch of them in that case. The answer is to absolutely positively have direct, proactive conversations with people who have their hands in the air right now saying, yes, I want to sell my house. And those are the things that we teach you to do in Premier Coaching. Yes. So what our coaching clients are doing with this is not just listening to the podcast and saying, oh, well, that's interesting. Maybe I'll try that. They're literally using this as their checklist and making sure that they're doing all of these things to ensure their success. So for a lot of you, you're probably feeling comfortable with maybe two or three of these 12 sources. Start with those and really drill down to increase your contacts and your level of skill. If you need scripts and skills, you've come to the right place. Just ask for help. Waiting is not profitable. And then once you're getting results from those two or three resources, then you add the next one. You may have even dabbled in all 12, but not really taken each to the next level. So what would happen if you decided you will take eight to 10 listings this quarter, no matter what, and simply do what we've laid out for you in the podcast, supported, of course, by coaching. Now, some of you listening are already used to listing and selling eight to 10 homes per quarter. Which of the 12 sources do you still need to add to your skill set to take your business to the next level? That's really the bottom line, guys. Listen, this is probably going to be one of the best opportunities 
to be become a listing agent in the last 15 years in the real estate industry because we're entering in a time where there's going to be a lot of expired listings. Sellers are going to be a hell of a lot more careful who they list with. And 99% of your competitors are going to have no idea how to actually be proactive lead generators, let alone have any sales skills. And that helps the sellers through what will be for many of them a very stressful time because of the inflation and interest rates and all mm -hmm. the rest of the things that are going on in the world. When you take a skills-based approach in real estate right now, you will have unbelievable frankly, cash flow and your business will accelerate faster than it ever has or ever would have probably in the last 15 years. You don't have to buy leads in this market, guys. The leads are falling off trees. You just have to be the one to find the orchard and then know how to pick up the apples from the ground. And that's what's having, frankly, a skills-based approach to the business is. Guys, ultimately, do not build your mansion on land you do not, own, do not own. Do not build your future on things that you cannot control. That's what that means. Proactive based approach to real estate is what we always will preach and it's because it is land you own. But what are the five things ultimately that we want you to master as a real estate professional? It's very simple guys. And by the way, all these things are skills based approaches, but once you have these skills, you can't have them taken away from you. If you choose to develop these skills when you're living in Michigan and you want to move to Miami, you can and your skills will go along with you and you can replicate the business you had in Michigan down in Miami. You can then be free. You can choose where you want to live. You can choose the sale price. Maybe you're living in Michigan and the average sale price isn't going to you know, make it so that you can live the life of your dreams and live to your potential. Move to a different market. And by the way, it can be a hell of a lot warmer climate where maybe the economy is better. Maybe the sale price is better. You can only have that approach when you have a skills-based approach to the real estate business. So what are those five things? Very simple. Proactive lead generation, pre-qualifying, presenting, negotiating, and very good lead follow-up skills. All of those are skills that all of you can master. Eventually, you're going to either do one of two things. You're going to wish you would have, or you're going to be glad that you did. It's up for you to decide. So guys, thank you for continuing to make this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Have a fantastic day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.